That was amazing. Oh. Really amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You were a wonderful audience. I really, I really appreciate your. I could sense. I could sense your participation. That's wonderful. So I wanted to start, I guess, by asking a, just a little bit more about the instruments, mostly because I was curious, and I'm sure maybe others are as well. A lot of these instruments seem to me like they must be quite old in terms mm -hmm. of historical significance. I was just wondering if you could talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. They're definitely old. If, the <coughs> if you look at old manuscripts, for example, medieval manuscripts, even early, early um, uh, evidence shows that uh, in antiquity they played instruments with long necks. Uh, ancient Egypt, of course, we see them uh, in the, in the very much in paintings and like that. Uh, the uh, some of the instruments change, of course, in time, but the type of instruments that are played, uh, you find uh, predecessors to those, in, certainly. And and did you start playing when you started playing as a young person? Were you playing the the reed instruments first, or the stringed instruments first? I would think uh, maybe reed. Uh, our house had a reed garden behind behind the house, and that was great. It was the, my toys go play in the reed garden and <laughs> make flutes? <laughs> so that's definitely. Uh, my mother played the violin a little bit and showed me where the fingers go. Uh, my uncles. On both sides, especially on my mother's side, uh, they played oud and violin. So there was so much, so much music in the house, really. My father was a writer and a poet, and he wrote many, many, many books with 16 bestsellers. He, he's a folklorist, storyteller, and very, very humorous in his when he tells stories. Uh, he loved music, too. but. Um, Others definitely. He didn't play instrument, but he loved the music. And how did you come to sort of find the ones that spoke the most to you in terms of your musical uh, education, whether that was formal mm -hmm. or informal? Yeah. I was curious. There was a time when I was, I would say, exploring uh, the instrument, the whole gamut of different instruments. I was like maybe a kid, uh, want all the toys, uh, and play them all in my case. I played the, um, probably was early teens or even earlier, I already fooling with the oud, with the violin, and with, with, uh, with some of the flutes, not the nai uh, is more challenging. As I was 13 years old when somebody went to Egypt, a friend of my father, and brought an eye and said, this is uh, for your son, he might learn how to play. And I played it quite a bit because I already had played flute instrument, uh, flute types. Later on, two instruments uh, became so, I would say, close to my instincts, and close to my heart, I would say. And these are the um, bozok, the instrument with the long neck, and the uh, the nai, the reed flute. Oh, the reed flute is, I feel that it really is very powerful. I almost go to a, a kind of state of consciousness, different state of consciousness when I'm playing it. Uh, it uh, has a lot of affect connected with that, with that flute. So these two instruments, but I still, um, I'm still attached to so many instruments, uh, and I find myself, uh, when I travel, I, I, it's hard to travel sometimes with so many instruments, uh, believe me. <laughs> uh, but I've found a way to pack them sometimes in um, golf bags <laughs> and bring them in. Everybody thinks that I'm playing golf, and they give me uh, advice where to go. And <laughs> so. I take the advice, of course, <laughs> I want to be polite, so. And then I wanted to ask a little bit about the tuning, because it seemed to me that you did a little bit of tuning with each instrument, and then I was particularly interested towards the end with the reed instruments, and mm -hmm. I wasn't exactly sure what you were doing, but I was curious, 
because I know the tuning is probably different in Arabic music mm -hmm. and than in Western music. And if you could talk about that a little bit sure, for us. Sure, sure. That um, thing we call microtone uh, came out when I played specially, I think, the oud, uh, the first piece I played on the oud, and the flute, the nai flute. These, these are natural sounds. They just don't happen to correspond to the equal tempered uh, diatonic tuning that you have on a piano, uh, for example, or the frets on a banjo or guitar. If you were to play those notes, you need extra frets in between. If you look at my bozok, it has maybe twice of the frets that you have on a banjo, say. I keep adding because sometimes the, all the notes move a little bit and you have to, depending on the mode that you're playing in and where in the improvisation uh, you are. So um, these, uh, the money scales, so many mo uh, so the, co uh, the modes, the modal system, there are many of the modes, and each mode embraces a scale. And those scales, some of them are very uh, familiar to the Western ear. Others have some of the notes that fall in between. But I grew up with those. I mean, they don't sound out of tune for my ears. They might for somebody who doesn't know the music, but, but they're really, I would call they're just regular notes, depending on what piece you're playing, what scale it is. And then I wanted to ask a little bit about, you said you had composed some of the pieces mm -hmm. that you played and then you played some um, more popular pieces, but I was just curious about your composition, pr you know, your process and how you do it and does it, is it iterative over time? Do you compose a piece and then keep changing it or is it a finished piece or? The uh, process of composing is there's so much trial and error. Some people Im imagine a, a great piece and they write it down. I don't do it that way. Uh, sometimes I sit and play, maybe for hours, trying to decide what sounds good to my ears. And it has to be kind of natural, spontaneous. And the music has to talk to me, just to talk to people. I've, um, I've I think sometimes when I repeat phrases in a composition and one phrase says, this is it, I'm here for you. So that's, that's really how I compose. Uh, the um, uh, the in d also depends on the instrument you're composing on. Uh, the uh, things I compose on the oud, for example, they sound like oud music, uh, naturally. And on the buzzard, the long neck, they have uh, it says metal strings and they have like drones, those uh, notes that you start thrum them all and they produce kind of a harmonic uh, kind of effect. So that's, th I think that um, um, it's an important, I think, also consideration. Did you, um, when you perform out and about, we had the sort of ex extreme pleasure of having you play as a soloist, but I imagine you, from what I've read and listened to, um, you you play a lot with ensembles and different kinds of groups. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. what what's different for you when you play by yourself versus playing with an ensemble? Playing with uh, depends, of course. Uh, <coughs> if the ensemble shares my tradition, then we we play together, and we don't need to talk much because we all we need to do is communicate and sound. It's amazing how musician, that's one good topic to study about the body language. Uh, the drummers, for example, uh, that they play with, sometimes we don't have to uh, just nod or slow down or speed up. Or we, They look at me and I look at them and there's that, that language. The playing with groups that play different types of music is interesting. I've done so much of the uh, playing with um, fusions with uh, other musics. The um, certain musics have affinity with Middle Eastern music. Uh, the, I think, number of music stand out as being 
sort of communicable to somebody from the Middle East. For one would be Indian music because the improvisation and the modes and things like that, the rag. Also flamenco. Oh, flamenco, just musician. I played so many flamencos from uh, a group from Spain last time in Detroit, but others uh, toured with flamenco musicians uh, for many, many cities in this country. There are certain almost like modal, uh, scalar things that's similar. So we, we find the common denominator in the two groups and, and we do it. It's a challenge, sometimes works very well, sometimes it doesn't, but, but the, it, it's, it's fun, it's fun to try. Um, another thing I noticed while you were talking during the performance was you mentioned improvisation. And again, when I was doing some reading about you, I was trying to understand and coming from a very layman's position, but improvisation in Arabic music, I think, is a little bit different um, as well. And I was wondering if you could help us understand that better. Mm -hmm. oh, many, many world musical traditions value and cultivate improvisation because it's an art form. And in my case, at least, we start playing pieces before we attempt to improvise. And the improvisation is considered challenging. It's considered as something that reflects the tradition because these modes that we improvise in represent the theory. And if you improvise well, that means you know your music very well. Then people who improvise um, consider being sensitive, musically sensitive, and very um, sort of have a feeling for the music because improvisation um, considered also very emotional, very affective, the improvisation. Sp in part because, probably because improvisation in general in Arab music uh, are not metric, there's no meter. And almost like you're telling a story, it flows and has a structure where you start and the lower note typically, sometimes, most of the time, and then you f find your way. It's like a journey and you come back. So you have to engage the audience when you improvise. You have to tell them the story. You have to start the, the story well and take the audience with you especially if the audience is knowledgeable about the music, they know exactly what you're doing. And when they know that, they get ecstatic. And they reflect that into the musicians. The musicians get even more ecstatic. We call the concept in, in Arabic is tarab. Tarab means musical ecstasy, or you get really almost moved, you go into a state, a musical state, and musicians also feel uh, something like that, very close, called saltana, which means inspirational ecstasy. And when they see people responding, they excel. And how do, how does the audience, I'm just curious, like what is the, how are they expressing themselves to the musician? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it gesture or voice or a combination of those things? I think as somebody from a different culture, uh, started in a different culture where people, where, a mus where audiences, especially like in Beirut, Cairo, you know, in different places, the audience is more, um, more demonstrative in their feelings. They, they utter compliments from the audience. Uh, they, uh, they, the body language there and they, you know, thing like, and there's phrases, they utter certain phrases uh, that reflect what they're feeling. It's not just you're great, but it's like, I'm really moved. Look, you know, I'm, I'm transformed, just like that. And that's very important for uh, installing uh, that, uh, that uh, state in the musicians, because they, they need that. Uh, 
now, interest question, what happened to music musicians like me coming to this country and playing for audiences not from that culture? At the first glance, uh, some musicians uh, get a little, um, little confused, and the assumption is, are they really enjoying it or not? But, but I learned with assurance that they are, I could tell when the audience, regardless of where they're from, if they're really with the music, I can tell. We develop that sense, certainly. So it's, uh, it's, they're enjoying, but their way of expressing may be different. Maybe somebody from another country, yet not west or east, but somewhere other places, and they may enjoy the music, but, but uh, the, each group would might express it differently. Yeah, that, it's interesting because I think uh, for uh, audiences here, for instance, I think generally we're sort of taught to be quiet, <laughs> you know, and, you know, not have that kind of expression, which I think probably sometimes occasionally you'll hear somebody and, and, and it almost feels a little bit, oh, wow, they're saying something or they're singing something or they're yeah, doing something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it makes sense, of course. And, um, and, so ecstatic music, this this concept, is that something that you teach when you're teaching at UCLA as part of your curriculum? That's a good question. I've often asked, how do you how do you teach an audience on an, an American university, like UCLA, to uh, to feel the music? Because I don't, n I can't get in their heads. I don't know their. Sometimes they s look excited, but I don't know if they're exciting for the same, the process that I have when I get excited about the music. The, uh, the answer, is it teachable? The, uh, the, the question, is it teachable? The answer is yes. I have taught students who really respond idiomatically to the music. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's like when something is very ecstatic in the music, they get excited. Uh, part of it was done through um, playing for the students. These are performers or people who just want to learn about the music. To, for example, play a recording of a live recording of Um Kul Thum, a very, very famous uh, uh, singer uh, from Egypt, and very well known. And you hear the audience get excited uh, vocally, they're clapping, different kinds of things. And once, th I think if you hear that much and begin to understand why that cadence, that ending moved people so much, and if you learn how to play and you begin to appreciate what well, something is good. Wow. I, I, um, one thing it may, um, uh, made me think about a little bit when I was reading about your work is the notion that a lot of us have that experience where you hear a piece of music could be from anywhere in the world and maybe you've never been there and maybe you know almost nothing about the culture but the music speaks to you in some very deep emotional way and that was sort of what I was wondering sure. if that's what the uh, experience of ecstatic <coughs> music might be like. Yeah, that, that's, that's also a good question. Uh, why do, how do people appreciate different musics that have never, have never been to the country or they have heard the music for the first time. One thing mysterious about music is that it affects people in different ways. Some people might be interested in the rhythm. Some other people may be interested in the timbre, the kind of sound produced so, so much. I've, I've recorded on films quite a few in, in, in Los Angeles. And um, I play certain things, and the um, producers would be sitting there and says, oh, yeah, exactly, I want that, it's very good. I mean, they're not from that culture, but, but there's something speaks to them at what I did. So that's, th that's, that's the nature of music. That it's really, it's not just words. It's not like a language we have to learn the grammar and things like that. Some, it's more than that. It is, it's a language in a certain sense. It's languages, plural. But, uh, but that has the message is more complex, is more, more multi layered. 
Well, I think that's a good thing for us to all, <laughs> you know, <laughs> take in. I uh, wanted to offer the audience if there are any questions in the audience for Dr. Rossi. We do have a microphone out there somewhere, don't we? <laughs> okay. I see a question back there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, w I was wondering, you talked about how improvisation is uh, kind of a, a learning experience, and it's like learning is an important part of why you uh, feel improvisation is important. I, w I, w I wondered what, uh, if you could sort of explain or talk about that a little bit and what sort of <laughs> things uh, you feel like we learn from imp improvising. Yeah, improvisation implies a measure of freedom and that through that measure of freedom you test the grounds uh, you um, through improvisation uh, I came up with my composition so my best compositions were just sitting and playing without notes without any model strict model I'm going by my instinct musical instinct the um, and that 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 process has um, enable me to not just to influence people who really love the the sound of the music but also to use my maybe unconscious uh, side of my of my musical thinking that brings up things that I never thought of uh, melodies that I don't know how I came up with it's uh, it's it's very cre can be very creative even if you just play by yourself in in, in, in your bedroom and like that and um, in terms of uh, in terms of um, just creativity and finding out things learning ways to play that I've never ex experimented before uh, the um, it's interesting the culture I come from. Do they play more than say exercises. People ask me so much, what are the exercises you have your students do? I say, well, in that culture, they just play. They don't play scales forever, mm -hmm. and they just play again and again. And uh, then comes the improvisation, and when they when they uh, learn how to improvise. Uh, they learn more about their own potentials as well as the potentials of the instruments as well as the potentials of the music itself. Do we have any other questions in the audience? We have one there and one back there. So with a lot of uh, the non-improvisatory music that you play, are those notated? Uh, it's or actually- Are they just like rote learning? It's all, all, all uh, uh, orally. Uh, Gums, um, it's if you notate it somehow, people say you know you're cheating somehow, but it has to be just on this on the spot. However, there is a the modes, the modes that I use, they have they have a structure to them somewhat. You have to know you have the scale, you have the cadences that how you end the phrase. So it's both actually in a way. It's um, but the, it's as as a rule. The improvisation is not uh, notated, except maybe some people. Some people ask me to notate it so that they can start somewhere and learn the sound. Uh, the it's and part of it is it's a good question actually. The the the, uh, the another something related to that. How much are you thinking what you want to do when you're improvising? Is it just let go, hundred percent? Or is it self hundred percent control? And I would say it has to be a little of both. If you just anything goes, you might go off and do things that are not interesting. So yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, we had one more in the back there. Oh, two more in the back. Yeah. Well, that was a great concert, thank you so much. My question relates to the role of harmony in the Middle Eastern music, and I get the impression that both in the Middle Eastern and also in the Indian music, there's very little use of harmony, while in Western music, it's like everything is harmonized. 
Um, can you give us some perspective historically of why do you think it is that Western music developed um, such an admiration for harmony while the Middle Eastern music um, is more... Um, melodic. Melodic, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is a, con a <coughs> question that's been asked quite often about different musics. The, I think s each um, culture seemed to look for complexities in the different parts of the music. The, um, the West developed harmony uh, early, early in history, uh, and the, the probably there are several theories, certainly. Some theories go back to certain um, folk singing in Europe, for example, and uh, also going back to so theories, maybe back also to ancient theory, maybe Greek theory, things like that, looking for predecessors for the uh, consonants and dissonance, all the theories of that things you find. The um, music of India and the Middle East, uh, really the complexity is in, in the ornaments, very in the intonation, in the uh, improvisation. It's a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge for many people who don't know the music, any music actually, to sound very accurately like a native of that music. The, uh, when I teach uh, this type of music, I find that it's really uh, sometimes a challenge because how do you uh, inculcate the microtones and the Western ear and how to, um, uh, how to perform without, without meter, for example, in, uh, improvisation. And the, 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 or, the or, it's very ornate music. For example, Persian music has very distinctive ornaments, and you have to be well trained to produce those specific ornaments. So, uh, the having said that, uh, many musics, including Middle Eastern music and maybe India, maybe other musics that seem melodic, uh, seem melodic they do occasionally use drones and sometimes uh, shifting drones. Uh, so there, there, there's a certain aesthetic there that allows itself when people, for example, play in groups, mm -hmm. there were several musicians, you know, some people's like they hold a drone or a, uh, we know, a repeated pattern uh, in the background, especially in dance music, and this repeating pattern can change as well. So again, the complexities are just are, are there, but one would have to identify them and learn them, I suppose. Okay, well I think we can take one more question down here. Oh, is there one in the back there? Yes. Sorry. Yes. We'll come to you just a second. Please. Is this on? Uh, yes, mentioning the microtones, there are Western musicians who are working with those, including Bart Hopkin, who has been a musician in residence here. Um, but so few of the Western instruments are capable of rendering them. I have heard excellent Middle Eastern music performed on accordion and bandonian, for example. But are there any other instruments you can think of that uh, adapt that well? Well, the strings. These string instruments uh, in Western music, uh, they, they're very flexible in terms of intonation. They go the violin, viola, cello, bass, thing like that. They, uh, that's one reason why the Middle East, including, of course, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, mm -hmm. that became a tra sort of traditionalized instrument because they, it's an instrument that you can tune it differently uh, for, for convenience. Sometimes you could tune it G, D, G, D. And the we could you know frets so you can you can really play those uh, ornaments uh, quite a bit. I teach the the Middle Eastern style, the, the Arab style on the on the, uh, on the on the violin at my group that I teach at UCLA. Uh, it's um, other than that, there's certain maybe uh, things that you can bend the tone. Maybe some people, especially the clarinet, might might allow a little bit of that. But you're right. The uh, many many of the instruments do not uh, do not um, perform that, and we should also remember that um, uh, before the equal temperament 
came to uh, European music, s there was also the intonation was slightly different, and probably they tuned the harpsichord, the different kind of tunings, and you find that sometimes the tuning did not match exactly the piano tuning as, as we hear it today. Okay, I think we have one more here. Okay, I have just a question. I'm, I'm Persian myself, and I heard that always uh, our music is related to poetry very much, that these two are, are not separable. How much is it, I want to think in Arabic, is it also more poetry, you know, just music, something that you can sing as a poetry, and, was and that's why it's always accompanied with poetry. Good question, yeah. Uh, particularly in Persian music, poetry is very, very important. If to the extent that sometimes the rhythm, when they play avaz or, or tasnif, something like that, you find sometimes ta 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 ra da la 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 la. It just comes. Uh, so Karishme, they have names too, and uh, it's so closely um, uh, it has very close the the performance of the musical instruments. I mean, avaz is like singing. Uh, and become the and the famous 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 Sufi poets, Hafez, Saadi, all these uh, Khayyam, and they they really um, they sing them. They they are very important. Rumi, all these these uh, Arab poetry poetry is very very important. Not not as much in Turkish and Arab music. I think they the rhythm there they have rhythmic patterns. They call usul in Turkey and iqa in Arabic. And these musicians like stick to that. You compose a piece. You first, you have to decide what meter, what uh, what rhythmic pattern, and then you you build the the structure. Very important, especially, and you have to strict these with it. Strict when you when you when you compose. You could change it, of course. You can speed it and things like that. But um, you seeing that flexibility with the tone back. For yeah. example, this was like virtuosic, very virtuosic instrument. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you, Ida. Thank you.